What's up, everybody? Chris Wilk here. Chris Wilk Podcast, episode number 98. Today we're recording from the house. You can see this wonderful white wall behind me here. We don't have the stone. I'm not in the gym. Dude, there's too many animals in there, man. <laughs> Last week, I'm listening to just, uh, it sounded like families of birds chirping away. And, uh, like, boy, that probably sounds awful on the audio. So, I'm going to be inside here today. We'll avoid the birds. I just got the watch out of our wonderful window here. Our horses just got put out. These two, these two horses have been in for a few days because of the weather. We got terrible rain, and our property just becomes a swamp. So to preserve their feet a little bit, we uh, they, they they were just in, man. They're in their stalls, right? And who likes being locked up, right? They they get a little antsy and they're pantsy. And uh, so I'm out there, I'm watching them, man. They're sprinting back and forth. They're jumping, kicking, running, like they do this thing where their back legs, they jump their front legs up, then kick their back up, and their whole body's airborne. They're like bucking around, doing all this crazy stuff. And I realized, man. There's not one species, man. There's probably not one thing on this earth that likes to be cooped up, locked up, not being able to get outside, have some fun, and, and, and play a little bit, right? I like watching these horses play, uh, but they are so big and powerful. The other day, man, on Saturday, we had um, we had a youth camp out here. We had over 20 kids here, right? And I think the, the stress of these kids running around being crazy, yelling, screaming, running, she really stressed this one horse out. Somebody comes to ride this horse. This thing, this thing's not having it, man. It's totally on edge. He's like running, jumping to the point where it almost put himself in harm's way. Kind of got himself tangled on something. He starts freaking out, and I'm standing there like, "What in the world are we gonna do here?" Luckily, it worked itself out. Calmed down, got the horse back to the paddock that it was in. Literally a few minutes later, I hear this wrestling around. <laughs> this crazy noise. I look up. A hawk snags a bird. Pretty much from the roof of our, of our gym here, of uh, the barn. Snags it, flies away. I see two ladies over here, and I'm like, hey, did that just, is that a bird it just grabbed? They were like, yeah. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, man. I'm out here. This farm living, man, is kind of wild. There's freaking, <laughs> you see some stuff out here, man. But anyhow, you know, that's just kind of the law of nature, right? As we get into this Forrest Gump book, what we're gonna talk about, Lieutenant Dan said it best. He said, that's just the way it is, right? Life eats life. And unfortunately, I get to see this thing play out every day. Now, back to the book, right? Or No, not even back to the book. We didn't even get there yet. Forrest Gump. Just learned about two months ago. It's a book. Had no clue. Winston Groom wrote it. Now, Winston, I apologize. I don't know if you're alive, and I, there's probably a great chance you're not going to hear this, but uh, I think I think this book was was bad. It was not for me. I'm, maybe I'm not a fiction guy. I'm kind of a nonfiction reader all the time, but I was like, dude, i got to stop reading this heavy stuff. I'm reading Jordan Peterson and all this other stuff. I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta lighten it up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I read, I read Forrest Gump, and I'm just freaking dreading it. I'm like, dude, I gotta get done with this book. It's a quick hitter. Um, I just kept plugging away, trying to hammer through this thing, and and that that brings me to the question: Are you one of those people that finishes a book if you start it, or? Do you just throw that thing in the trash and move on to the next thing? Now, Maurice is giving me crap. Like, dude, why are you reading it? Why are you reading it? If you don't like it, stop. And I'm like, no, I got to finish this. And I'm kind of glad I'm dead. But boy, was I fed up, dude. I, if I would have done this podcast when I finished it, I would've, it would have been like a, a freaking rant. Basically, Forrest Gump is born. They tell me he's an idiot his whole life, right? He gets put into a special home. His mom is a mess, okay? His mom is like, cries all the time totally dependent on her boy, tries to make her boy feel guilty if he leaves. That stuff goes on the whole time, right? Poor old me, blah, 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 right? So his mom is terrible. Jenny, his his childhood friend who becomes a love interest, is kind of, she's kind of promiscuous, man. She gets around in this book a little bit. She even gets around with Forrest. So it's interesting, man. She She's not, uh, she, she, she's questionable, we'll say. Questionable. Questionable decision made uh, with her mate. Uh, so we got the mom's a little nutty. We got Jenny's kind of a hoe. All right, excuse my language. Um, and then we got Forrest, man. Forrest, six foot six, 245 pounds of just solid steel, dude. Freaking athlete, man. Now, Tom Hanks, sorry, bro, but that ain't you. That ain't even The Rock. Like, Forrest Gump in this book is just on another level. So, tremendous athlete, right? Great football player, goes to school. Then he gets into the war. Apparently, in their words, they call him an idiot, right? He's not even smart enough to get into the war, but somehow finds his way in Vietnam. Somehow finds his way to his own college football teammate, Bubba. They find each other in Vietnam. 
he finds his other he finds all these people along the way from his previous life in all these random spots so it's like okay whatever it's a book I get it it's fiction you can make up whatever you want then craziness starts to happen right this guy all like great football player war hero what else does he get himself into becomes a professional wrestler a good one too world class chess player <coughs> sorry about that an actor on set with Raquel Welsh this is the one that took me over the top man so let me get a drink quick my voice is still not back some guy sponsors him he's a great chess player oh dude not even that dude I forgot about the worst thing goes to freaking space with a monkey and a woman NASA NASA brings him on Goes to space. They crash land in some water. Guess what happens? They don't get picked up for four years. They live with cannibals. Yeah, this is the this is that this is the thing that took me over the top. They live in the jungle with cannibals for four freaking years. Somehow get out of that situation. Then he somehow finds this monkey, this ape, this chimp, whatever it was, in Hollywood. On set with Raquel Welsh. While he's in town for a chess tournament, somebody discovers him. <coughs> and this stuff just happens over and over again. R.I.P. to Bubba. Bubba doesn't make it out of Vietnam. But Gump goes down to Bubba's hometown, right? Meets with his father. Father shows him where to shrimp. Then Gump creates this great shrimp business. Super successful. Guess who he brings on board? His old college football teammates. Come on down. Some other people from his past life. Come on down. Turns out he gets so successful, he doesn't know what to do. He's got to start hiring people, man. He just starts shrimping, shrimping, shrimping. Becomes this great guy. And uh, it's pretty much towards the end of the movie, right? Sorry, end of the book. He comes across Jenny again. All right? Randomly, of course. Hears him playing the harmonica. I forgot to add that incredible harmonica player in addition to being a world-class chess player and an uh, astronaut apparently and all this other crap jenny's got a little kid man jenny jenny named her kid forrest forrest jr so looks like old mr gump we got himself a son and that's kind of how the book ends now after my annoyance of all this crazy stuff that would never happen in somebody's life. Once I dissect all that, I, I get over it. I'm like, you know what? Let me look at my notes from this book. So that's where we're at right now. Notes on Forrest Gump book. This will not all be negative. I got my negative out, I think, with that five-minute rant. Here we are. There's a pleasure sure in being mad, which none but madmen know, Dryden. This idea, a pleasure in being mad, which none but madmen know, this led me to a thought where to, they called Force an idiot, which is why I'm going to use that term now. Does somebody that's referred to as an idiot, do they know that they're an idiot? Is somebody that's crazy, do they know that they're crazy? If somebody's a lunatic, do they know that they're a lunatic? Like, these are things that I think about. Or, in order for you to be crazy, do you have to not understand that you're crazy? Don't know. Maybe Plato knows that. Maybe Socrates un unpacked that decades, thousands of years ago. I don't know that answer right now, but I think about it often when you talk to people and I'm, sometimes I'm just like, wait a second. Are they, are they for real? Is this person legit? Do they know what they're talking about? Do they know how crazy they sound? And if they don't, then maybe they are crazy, you know? Or maybe not. Uh, who knows? Forrest Gump. We'd win a lot of races before to see how fast we could run. But I get a lot faster when I'm being chased, I guess. What idiot wouldn't? That's the most insightful thing that I heard Forrest Gump say in, in, in the world of coaching athletes, right? We always do this with young kids. We always do this with older kids. We always do this with uh, whatever level. If you want somebody to run fast, you got to have somebody chase them. It's either chase, chase a person, or have that person be chased. Me and my boy Frank, we used to run some hills. I would start out front. He would come flying behind me, trying to chase me, and I'd be working my tail off to get up to the top of that hill before he got me. That's how we did it, man. Uh, you run harder. You get the effort level up when you're working with kids. And 
this is only starting to tap into it because it's not a real fear, right? It's not, it's just you, you and another buddy are chasing each other, right? But you, you, I was thinking too when I read this, like, just imagine where your speed potential is when something truly scary is chasing you. Like, I wonder how much faster you run where, all right, my friend's chasing me now, but what about if there's like a person trying to rob you in an alleyway? Like, are you, how much faster are you in those situations than you are in normal? Can your body just tap into this un this potential that it has? You hear about those moms lifting cars off of people, right? Like, do we have this untapped physical potential that we don't even know about? And the only way that it comes out is in these fear, you know, these fearful situations. I don't want to find out what mine is, man. I, I don't want anything to do with that. But it got me thinking about that, right? You play it out on lower levels, you see people could run harder. You get greater effort. Now imagine if your life was was on the line, right? How, how fast would you be running then? And, uh... I don't think we understand that yet in terms of our human potential. Now he met a, a lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan. It were Dan's philosophy that everything that happens to us, or for that matter, to anything, anywhere, is controlled by natural laws that govern the universe. Moving on, like when a tiger pounced on a monkey in the jungle. Bad for the monkey, but good for the tiger. That's just the way it is. Now, when I think about that first part, Natural laws that govern the universe. I brought this up a couple, a couple weeks ago. Maybe now it's a couple months. Uh, where it's like once that die gets rolled, right? Is it? Are we able to kind of take control back and, and stop something before it goes uh, before it goes too far? Or once the die is cast, is it gone? Is it? Is it? Is it out there? And is it going to turn into whatever it, whatever it's going to be? Right? I think I talked about it in the Russia Ukraine episode. Like, are we at this point now where we can't do anything to stop this? There's nothing we could do. It is what it is. The ball's rolling. The die has been cast. Or is there stuff that we can do to kind of take it back? Do we have the power as individuals to control what goes on in the universe? Or does the universe go on its own? We talk about people growing up in certain circumstances. They could use those circumstances as an excuse, right? It's like I was born this way, so I became that. Or they could do the opposite. That's their actions that they take. But... They might not have been able to take those actions, those positive actions, if they weren't dealt that crappy hand. Some people get dealt a crappy hand and work one way. Some people get dealt a crappy hand and work the other way. But all those experiences, those are two unique experiences that happened to those two people. You can't replicate the same experiences. So all of those experiences led them to be something. Do we have control over those experiences? You can't control where you're born. You can't control who your parents are. What can you control? Lieutenant Dan doesn't believe doesn't believe you control much, man. Natural laws. Once the dice cast, it's cast. You know what I think, man? Attitude, our effort, and our actions, man. Those are three things that we can control. And we need to do the best of our job, no matter what the circumstances are. Whether or not we can change the natural laws or not, we always control our attitude, our effort, and our actions, right? Moving on. Oh, anyway, the tiger man, tiger pouncing on a monkey, terrible. Like I said about that hawk and that bird, man. Whew, life eats, life eats life. What's good for one is bad for another. There's kind of like this, it's not a zero something, but there's always this yin and yang, this give and take with certain actions, with certain behaviors. And there's always going to be some unintended consequences and there's going to be some intended consequences. Back to the book. And so I says yes, which is usually what gets me in trouble every time. Now, Forrest Gump had a habit of saying yes to things. He wasn't a no guy. He was just, sure, let's do it. And this got him into some trouble, led to him and his lady, Jenny, getting into some fights, led to him finding himself in all these different areas of life, right? Because he didn't know how to say no. So I think it was a book, The Power of No. It's either that or an article I read a couple years ago. Uh, shared to me by an old friend and uh, you know it's either you're going to say hell yeah to something or, or you, if you don't say hell yeah to it if it's just a sure the real answer should probably be no everything that we do here Matt, like uh, every little action that we do we only have so much time right we we heard about the bird right we heard about that monkey getting pounced by a lion we only have so much time on this earth so everything we do has got to be everything that we do matters every second that we every second of our day matters right it's got to be working towards something and the goal could be it doesn't have to be all this productivity stuff in terms of work it could be 
I'm going to take some time for myself, take some time for my daughter, take some time for my significant other, take some time for the job, or just take some time to just stare out your window and look at the animals, have fun out there. But everything that you do has, has, a, has a purpose, right? And it serves a purpose. So every time you say yes to something, it takes away from something else. And if you're okay with that, if what you're saying yes to is important and more important to some of these other things, then fine, go with it. Say, hell yeah, let's do this thing. But if it's not, all it's going to do is take some take some away from you, uh, your, your other areas that are important. I fall victim to this too, Forrest. I say yes to things. That, like I started coaching football again when I knew when I stopped, I should not, I should have stopped a year sooner. But yet I, I got asked to come back and I did. And I didn't do good. I didn't do a good, uh, a good job as a coach. Because it just, I wasn't into it as I once was six to eight years ago, right? I'm a different person, and I just didn't get that much enjoyment out of coaching. I didn't put in the work that I used to put in to be a great coach. So I stopped again, right? But I should, I knew better when I said yes that first time. It wasn't a hell yeah, so I should have said no. So we got to keep that in mind when we make decisions. Back to Lieutenant Dan. I have suffered a loss forced far greater than my legs. It's my spirit, my soul, if you will. There is only a blank there now. His war medals hang where his soul used to be. Man searching for meaning, Viktor Frankl. He couldn't control circumstances, but he, he could control how he dealt with those circumstances. Attitude, effort, actions. Those are the things that we always have. Those are the only things that we'll ever have, really. How we handle these situations is going to dictate, in Frankel's case, whether or not he lived another day or not. He saw that once people lost their their uh, their spirit, like Lieutenant Dan just said, when people lost their spirit, when they lost their soul, they quickly died. They got sick. They stopped eating. They stopped caring about things. Okay. We cannot let that happen to us. How we portray our circumstances is going to define whether or not, you know, we're happy in life or we're not happy in life. In this book, it always felt like there was a quest, a man's quest, like Frankel, like I just said, a man's search for meaning. Forrest Gump was always looking for something. I finally feel like I belong someplace. His whole life he's been on this journey, bouncing around doing this and that, and it was never really about what he truly wanted. Then he finally got to this point where he, he got his shrimp and business going. He started to feel good about life and finally felt like he belonged, you know. And that's kind of all what we're on a quest for, right? We're all searching for meaning and we're all searching for that sense of belonging. Going on. But let me tell you this. Sometimes at night... When I look up at the stars and see the whole sky just laid out there, don't you think I ain't remembering it all? I still got dreams like anybody else. And ever so often, I'm thinking about how things might have been. And then, all of a sudden, I'm 40, 50, 60 years old, you know? This is all of us, man. In a blink of an eye, we're going to be at an age where we look back and be like, well, what the heck did I just do with the last 10 years? You know, it almost takes one of these traumatic events, one of these, like, life altering things to snap us out of whatever funk we're in and get us working on the things that we want to work on when we're 40 50 60 we don't want to look back and be like man i wish i would have done x y and z we have to do it now we got to do it now if that's what you want make it happen put it into action somehow some way and it might take you decades to get there but as long as you just get there you know so you hear these success stories some of these people you know they don't start knocking on the door until they're in their 40s right what? Who cares if you're 28 and you don't know what's going on? Just keep putting in good work. Keep doing things that you're, you will find enjoyment in, and eventually you're going to find something that works for you. And at the end of this, I can always look back and say, at least I ain't led no humdrum life. And that's a goal for all of us, right? At the end of our time here, whatever it is, whatever it may come, and we can all look back and just say, I ain't led no humdrum life. I'll probably use different words, but the same idea is there, right? We can't live a life of regret. We cannot. That's going to be all for today. Forrest Gump written by Winston Groom. If you like fiction, it might be for you. If you're a guy like me, 
that reads way too much serious stuff. It was not good, but I did find a few glimmers in that book, right? And you just think about it. With every book, if you could pick up one thing and you read one book a month, that's 12 new things that you learn. If you read two a month, that's 24. The more you read, the more you learn, the more you learn, the more you grow. And the more you grow, the more likely you're going to get to that age of 40, 50, 60 and not look back with any kind of regrets. Hope you guys liked this episode. Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, it's out there. Thank you for the support. Keep liking, keep sharing. Let me know if there's a book you want to go over, a topic you want discussed, or anything like that, man. Feedback's appreciated. Hope you guys have a great day. Peace, everybody.